Hi, welcome to the channel Guidelines Decoded. Today we're going to talk about antiarrhythmic drugs and rhythm control strategy. So there are three main objectives to this talk. First one is indications of rhythm control strategy. Second is restoring the sinus rhythm or cardioverting the patient. And three, maintaining sinus rhythm using various antiarrhythmic drugs. I've purposefully not added any text to this talk as I believe it distracts the listener from the main message. So this lecture is actually completely convertible to a podcast format as well, if that's what you prefer. So grab a hot beverage and let's get started. There's a few indications where you would prefer rhythm control over rate control. First, we have the heart failure patients with persistent AF or high burden of paroxysmal AF. This is a class 1A recommendation to go for rhythm control strategy. The rationale is in new heart failure with high burden of AF or persistent AF, it should be suspected as the cause of the heart failure. Think of it as when you're trying to diagnose your insomnia and you're taking high doses of caffeine. Second indication, to improve the hospitalizations and mortality in heart failure patients, this is a 2A recommendation. This comes from the data of subgroup analysis of the Cabana trial and the East AFNet trial. Third, atrial fibrillation patients with a recent onset of less than one year, if you also have some kind of stroke risk factors, you should go for a rhythm control strategy. And this is a 2A recommendation based on the East AFNet trial and some registry studies. It improves outcomes for mortality, hospitalization, and stroke. Fourth, to improve symptoms. This is a two-way recommendation. When they looked at the patients who were being rate controlled, for example, the RACE2 trial that compared lenient rate control to strict rate control, it turns out in both arms, the patients remain quite symptomatic. In fact, 46% of the patients in both arms were symptomatic. So there is some role of using rhythm control strategy when the symptoms need to be controlled for a better quality of life. Fifth, rhythm control to decrease the likelihood of dementia. This is a relatively gray zone with evolving literature still. It's a 2B recommendation, may be considered. Here I will also add that just because the patient is symptomatic doesn't necessarily mean that they're gonna have worse prognosis. So just to recap, here are some factors that you would want to look for in your patient when choosing a rhythm control strategy. LV dysfunction, recent onset of AF, younger patient, patient preference, more symptomatic, and a smaller left atrium, less than four centimeters, all favor a rhythm control approach. Great, so you went for that rhythm control approach. First part of the rhythm control approach is to get the patient back into sinus rhythm, AKA cardioversion. There's two approaches you could take. You could electrically get them back into normal sinus rhythm by shocking them. It's a synchronized cardioversion. Second approach is using pharmacologic agents. How do you choose between the two? Well, let's look at some of the numbers. With electrical cardioversion, you get a 92% success rate. With pharmacologic agents, you get about 30 to 70% success rate. The downside to electrical cardioversion is it does require anesthesia, sedation, the downside to pharmacologic cardioversion, besides the low success rate, is a delayed effect. A caveat to this I will add is in a stable patient, when cardioversion is desired, start with an antiarrhythmic drug, especially when you want to continue that drug for maintenance purposes. Next, what's the indication for prompt cardioversion? Well, these include heart failure exacerbation, hemodynamic instability, MI, and when rate control is not tolerated or poorly controlled. But hold on, is your patient anticoagulated? Regardless of the chad vas score, you need to have your patient be on anticoagulation for three weeks prior to cardioversion. Safety comes first. Or TEE-guided cardioversion. This is a class 1A recommendation. Once you're done cardioverting the patient, they need to continue that anticoagulation for four more weeks, regardless of the chad vas score. If a left atrial thrombus is identified on imaging, you need to continue that anticoagulation and repeat the imaging in three to six weeks to make sure there's no residual 
thrombus. This is a class 1a recommendation. So how do you cardiovert when using electrical cardioversion? Maximum fixed energy biphasic shock is superior to low escalating cardioversion with no difference in adverse outcomes. Lastly, anterior posterior orientation of the pads slightly better than anterior lateral positioning of the pads. Okay, let's say you went for the pharmacologic approach. What are some of the agents that you can use? First, let's look at ibutilide. It's a class three agent, not to be used for HEFREF or severe LVH. Conversion rate is about 30%, and the mean time to conversion, only about 30 minutes. There is a risk of torsades, about one to 2%. So this needs to be initiated in a cardiac care unit and you need to pre-treat with magnesium. Second, amiodron can be used for heart failure patients, CAD patients, or LVH patients. So it's a good agent to have. Conversion rate is about 25 to 44%, but the onset is quite delayed up to several days. So if you need that prompt cardioversion, this is probably not the agent you wanna go for. Third, dofetilide, or commonly known as ticosin. This is generally not solely used for cardioversion, but when a maintenance approach with this drug is planned. Conversion rate is about 60%, and the mean time to conversion is slightly delayed, about 36 hours. Next, we have the class 1C drugs flaconide, propofenone. Again, they're contraindicated with structural heart disease, coronary artery disease, LVH, HEFREF. Conversion rate is about 50 to 60%, and the mean time to conversion is relatively quick, about 110 minutes. One of the great things about these drugs is once the effectiveness and the safety of this drug is established when a patient was admitted, they can use what's called a pill out of pocket approach. Imagine, a patient with infrequent episodes of paroxysmal AFib, which he is quite symptomatic from, you might save him the trip to the ED. One thing to remember is that they can convert you into atrial flutter with one-to-one -one conduction. So you do need to be on an AV nodal blocking agent when using these drugs. Here I will mention all these agents, make sure to look at that baseline EKG. Make sure your patient does not have sinus node dysfunction, AV conduction abnormality, or a QTC more than 500. In all these cases, it's a class three recommendation, so should not be used. I think the only exception would be when a patient already has an ICD or a pacemaker available for anti-bradycardic pacing, but that's a complex decision best left to an electrophysiologist. Okay, so you've converted your patient back into normal sinus rhythm. Now comes the tricky part how to maintain that normal sinus rhythm. While the success rate of cardioversion almost 90%, recurrence rate is very high. 57 to 63% of the patients have a recurrence within one month and 70 to 80% have a recurrence within one year. Those are huge numbers. Why you ask? Well, unless there was a reversible cause for the atrial fibrillation, the underlying substrate is still there. Therefore, there is a strong rationale to actually pre-medicate with antiarrhythmic drugs unless this is the first episode of atrial fibrillation or the episodes are very well tolerated and otherwise quite infrequent. This is a class 2A recommendation. So what is the efficacy when you do use an antiarrhythmic drug to maintain sinus rhythm? Uh, for amiodrone, it is higher than others, about 65%. For dofetilide, it is about 50 to 65%. For other drugs, it is around 30 to 50%. However, you go for that safer, less effective option first. Also, the goal needs to be pragmatic. You don't always have to achieve a normal sinus rhythm. Maybe a reasonable goal would be to reduce the symptoms, to reduce the burden, if that is something the patient is tolerating. Of note, antiarrhythmic drugs do not increase mortality except for amiodron and sotalol, which do have some increased mortality signals. So what antiarrhythmic drugs can we use? Let's look at this algorithm. In atrial fibrillation patients with prior MI or significant structural heart disease, including left ventricular ejection fraction less than 40%. On the left side, when a patient does not have any of these, all the options are pretty much available. On the yellow boxes, it's a 2A recommendation and Sotalol is a 2B recommendation. So as you move to the right side, where you do have 
one of the structural heart diseases, 1C drugs get dropped off. So the flaconide and the propofenone are dropped off. You can still use ticosin or dofetilide and dronidron in certain situation where the patient does not have NYHA 3 or 4 heart failure symptoms or recent heart failure exacerbation. One other instance where you do not want to use dronidron is where the sinus rhythm has not been restored because in patients with persistent atrial fibrillation, uh, studies have shown increased mortality with dronidron. As always, uh, amiodron is not preferred go-to drug. So if you have another option, that's the one to pick first. And then you can go on to amiodron if that does not work or is not well tolerated. And after that, you would consider sotalol. Now let's dive into these drugs a little bit more. So first we have flaconide and propofenone. Uh, these are 1C drugs. Uh, if you remember, uh, 1C drugs don't have much impact on the QT interval. The QT prolonging drugs are basically class one and class three drugs, but they can still be proarrhythmic. They can cause monomorphic VT and even VF in coronary artery disease patients. Therefore, they are contraindicated in those settings. Uh, as you may remember from the earlier part of this talk, you do need to have the patient on AV nodal blocking agent before using 1C drugs. That's a 2A recommendation to prevent conversion to uh, atrial flutter with one-to-one -one conduction. When using the drug infusion, something to monitor is uh, the QRS interval. If that is getting prolonged more than 25%, then you do want to discontinue the drug. Second, we have dofetilide or ticosin. Uh, this does have a potent effect on QT interval. It's a class three drug. Therefore, it needs to be initiated in patient and it requires three-day hospitalization where you have the patient on continuous uh, telemetry uh, for EKG monitoring and also need to monitor electrolytes and the kidney function. But it's a reasonably safe choice uh, as we saw in the algorithm for uh, structural heart disease, heart failure patients. Uh, the torsades risk is about 0.9 to 3.3 percent. However, up to 20 percent of the patients ha actually had to discontinue the drug due to acute prolongation or torsades. So uh, that's a significant amount of patients. Uh, once you have uh, initiated the drug successfully, uh, you do need to monitor EKG, kidney function, and electrolytes every three to six months. Uh, next, we have dronidoron. You might have noticed how it sounds very similar to amiodarone, and that is because it was uh, basically created to replace amiodarone. It's a structural analog, just does not have the iodine. And this was designed so it wouldn't have as much of the non card cardiac side effects, uh, which is true for the drug, but it also made the drug less efficacious. Uh, there's not much risk of torsades with this drug, even though it is a class 3 drug. Uh, it is to be avoided in heart failure patients with recent exacerbation or uh, NYHA 3 to 4 uh, symptoms, and also uh, persistent atrial fibrillation patients, as we discussed earlier. Then we move on to the amiodarone. Amiodarone is actually not uh, FDA approved for atrial fibrillation, but actually for ventricular arrhythmias. But is one of the most prescribed drugs for atrial fibrillation and is the most effective as well. However, it remains a second line option because of so many side effects that the drug has. Uh, these include pulmonary fibrosis in 1-2% to patients. The most common side effect is uh, related to the thyroid gland, so hypo or hyperthyroidism. Mean duration of when thyroid symptoms arise is around 6 months. Can widely range from anywhere between 2-24% to of the patients. There's also elevated transaminases, rarely leads to hepatotoxicity. Then there's photosensitivity, peripheral neuropathy, sinus bradycardia. It can also have corneal micro deposits and optic neuropathy. QT prolongation with this drug is common, but torsades is uh, quite rare, only about in 0.7% of the patients. Remember to monitor the TSH, the liver enzymes, uh, every three to six months get a baseline x-ray when you start this drug and EKG monitoring at least annually. Next, we have another second line option, which is Sotalol. There was increased mortality seen with this drug based on uh, meta-analysis from RCTs. However, they did include advanced heart failure patients in those trials, so it may still have a role in HEFPEF patients. It does have a strong QT prolongation and risk of torsade, so similar to Ticosin, it does need to be initiated in patient. It requires about three-day hospitalization with similar uh, monitoring. Finally, you do need to monitor, again, the electrolytes, the renal function, and EKG 
kg every three to six months with this drug. Uh, lastly, we have disopyramide, a uh, class one drug, uh, not used very frequently, but it does have a very potent anti-muscarinic uh, effect. So one of the indications for this drug is people who have vaguely mediated atrial fibrillation, such as in athletes or people who get uh, episodes during their sleep. One more indication is that it's negative inotropic, so it can be used for left ventricular hypertrophy. Okay, so that was it for this lecture. If you managed to listen to the end, you have passed the ADHD test. And if you enjoy listening to this format of lecturing, please consider subscribing because there's a lot more coming in. If you didn't like something about this lecture, please let me know in the comment section and I will see you next time.